The crash of that Egypt airplane dominated the news for days, with Donald Trump drawing some criticism from the press for quickly tweeting that it looks like terrorism. And he really got into it on MSNBC with Mika Brzezinski. I think the worry also is just how you will be as president and present your positions and your words. And there are some concerns that you might be trigger happy with your words. Like, for example. Oh, really? I'm the yes. one that didn't want to go into Iraq, Mika. I'm thinking of the future. We cannot continue to let things like this happen. Joining us now to analyze the campaign coverage, Betsy Woodruff, political reporter for the Daily Beast. Kelly Riddell. Deputy Opinion Editor for the Washington Times, and Joe Trippi, the Democratic strategist and Fox News contributor. Betsy, Mika really castigated Trump over that tweet. Candidates are usually a bit more cautious. He said what most people, I think, were thinking. Was that criticism fair? I think it's totally understandable. I mean, the reality is no authorities, no one from Egypt, no one from the United States government had said that this was a terrorist attack. Donald Trump, from the campaign trail, obviously, for political reasons, shouldn't have been the one to break that news. Now, of course, it's well, break understandable. break news, he was offering his opinion. Right, exactly. But, I mean, is to that say that that's the case, right, to put it out there, like it's a looks statement like, of fact. Looks like terrorism. But we know what he means there. I, I just think uh, it's totally understandable that folks would say maybe he should uh, keep his powder dry on that one. But when Mick Brzezinski goes from that to basically saying Trump is a warmonger, mm -hmm. trigger happy, mm -hmm. uh, did the media have an obligation to point out that he opposed the Iraq war fairly early, not, no evidence of before the war, and is less of a hawk than Hillary Clinton? Yeah, I mean, and a, lot of, and a lot of times when these decisions were made, he was a private citizen. He wasn't getting these intel reports. So he, he you know, he can... He, well, that he, doesn't let him off the hook completely. It doesn't let him off the hook completely. But listen, with this tweet, what he did is he took a direct stab at uh, Hillary Clinton and the Benghazi cover-up. And he basically went out and he said, this is an act of terror. The American people are sick of, like, covering this stuff up. We're going to call a spade a spade. I'm not a traditional politician. I am going, I'm breaking the establishment. I'm not reading off a scripted talking points. I'm just going to tell you how it is and I think that's it, that's that's who Donald Trump is and that's how he's running his campaign talk about I see you shaking your head Joe talk about winning the news cycle and you can come back to your point so Hillary Clinton hours later is on CNN with Chris Cuomo and she says it does appear to be an act of terrorism which is what Trump's tweet said but then she ends up getting questioned about Trump's tweet because he was out of the gate faster well no, that, that's what Trump did what Trump does is he either creates the news cycle or he jumps into one no matter what it is so a plane goes down Bam! He's right there, and he's in real time, and he's tweeting, and and that's how he's gotten to where he is. Do you say this admiringly as a former campaign manager, or uh, would it uh, keep you up at night? Uh, no, as a campaign manager, that's scary because you you don't know when your candidate's going to blow himself up, and it's totally possible. I mean, everybody keeps saying Trump never will, uh, but I think that's one of the problems that, yeah. that a lot of the other candidates out there can't. And Prob the Republicans probably can't not the best good. phrase in this yeah. in context, but I know yeah. you didn't intend it that way. All right, let me turn to the continuing fallout over this New York Times uh, piece last weekend. You know, two full pages about Donald Trump's relationships with and conduct toward women. The lead anecdote involved a woman named uh, Roanne Lane Brewer, uh, who pushed back hard uh, when she was portrayed as having a negative interaction with Donald Trump. Here she is on Fox and Friends, followed by the Times reporters defending their piece. They uh, told me several times, and my manager several times, that it would not be a hit piece and that uh, my story would come across the way that I was telling it, and honestly, and it absolutely was not. I believe Roanne has asked for an apology. Um, I mean, we, what do you say? We really stand by our story. Um, we, we believe we quoted her fairly and accurately, um, and that the story really speaks for itself. Is it damaging to the New York Times that the woman, this lead anecdote, who, by the way, went on to be Trump's girlfriend for several months, um, came out and basically said they got it all wrong? It's obviously not helpful. That said, of course, she didn't dispute that the words that they quoted her as saying. She didn't dispute that the anecdote happened. The only thing she said was that this was a positive interaction rather than a negative one. And the reality is New York Times readers can decide for themselves whether Trump's behavior that night was okay. There's a difference between behavior that's welcome and behavior that we necessarily find appealing from someone who years later will want to have the nuclear codes. What this was about, Kelly, is she was first met Donald Trump at a pool party mm -hmm. at Mar-a-Lago. Uh, he said, do you want to change into a swimsuit? Mm -hmm. She did, and then he introduced her as a beautiful Trump yeah. girl or something. The Times said this was a debasing experience. She said she was proud. So is, is, that, is that putting your finger on the journalistic scale? I think this is a classic case of these reporters having an agenda and having a preconceived narrative that they wanted to be proven true. And so they went through all the sources, and they, they put together a story that, they, they, that was preconceived, that basically touted the narrative of Donald Trump as kind of a creepy guy when this 
clearly has been proven baseless by 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 Rowan, as well as by Carrie Prejean, who what Miss USA, who said that they didn't even bother to interview her; they just went through her book and took excerpts and, and kind of placed them in in the story where they where they felt necessary. So it's not representative, and it clearly was a hit piece. Joe. Sure. Uh, look, I think it, it clearly showed bias. I mean, it, it, even you know, coming from my corner, it, it like there was no reason to lead, to do the whole lead of this thing with somebody that they say was debased, and she says she was happy. not yeah. unhappy. And she went on. So I mean, I think that does damage. I mean, whether it was biased or not, it damages the credibility of the story, and they shouldn't have put it that well, what way. What do you make uh, with Trump uh, pushing back hard against the New York Times, which is fine, lame, hit piece, and all that? But in the context of that interview with Sean Hannity that we showed at the top, uh, he brings up Bill Clinton and an allegation by Juanita Broderick dating to 1978. It was not made public for until 20 years. She says he raped her. That's never been proven. What do you make of Trump going there and the way the media should treat that? Well, we all, I mean, Trump's, Trump's going to go there. He's got, there's nowhere he won't go. Uh, so the Clintons have to, you know, prepare for that. It's going to be out. And the, and the press ha has to cover it when he says stuff like that. If I can add, Hillary Clinton, in an interview during her campaign, and said that women who make allegations that they're sexually abused or attacked deserve to be believed. She opened the door for, for Trump to bring this back, for reporters to bring this back, for the entire history of Bill Clinton's sexual shenanigans to be fair game. The press and loves this stuff, but it is about her husband. But, yeah, readers but, love this stuff too. But yeah. you know, Andrea Mitchell on NBC um, basically said that uh, Juanita Broderick's case has been disproven. Now that is not accurate. It's ne it's ne has never been disproven, and you know NBC's report uh, it still stands to this day. So the media partially is responsible. Uh, they need to actually report the truth on this and not drop off the unsavory things about Bill Clinton. And then you have the, the bimbo eruptions that Hillary Clinton was a part of in well, terms of the, I mean, when in you terms say of the that, 90s. Bimbo eruptions was not her term. It was a term of Bill Clinton's former chief of staff. And I am waiting to see the evidence that of Hillary Clinton's personal involvement. Carl Bernstein's book, um, okay. his biography of Hillary Clinton, lays it out. Um, you have George Stephanopoulos who quit the White House because of these reasons. And he puts that out in his book. He as didn't reasons. say he quit the White House because well, Oh, let me get you it's still going to be is like all the all most, if not all, this has been aired over and over and over and over again. I think it's what's going to be interesting is the more Donald Trump or the press goes on both of them in these areas. I don't think any, it's still going to be the economy. It's still going to be other things. And I think the press does get preoccupied with right. with with trying to follow. We have to plead guilty to this. There is a fascination with Trump yeah. and women, mm -hmm. and Bill Clinton and women, right. and Hillary's role in her husband's philandering. All right, let me move on because there was obviously a huge media buildup for the Fox Broadcast Network primetime special, the first one with Megyn Kelly. One of the guests was, of course, Donald Trump. Let's take a look at when they talked about whether uh, the candidate uh, had second thoughts about anything he's done in this campaign. So when you look back on the on the past nine months from that first debate to now, any regrets? Uh, absolutely, I have regrets. I don't think I want to discuss what the regrets are, but absolutely, I could have done certain things differently. I could have maybe used different language uh, in a couple of instances. But overall, I, you know, I have to be very happy with the outcome. What is the interview revealing? Not particularly. I mean, for him to say I could have used different language at some point is perhaps the vaguest possible thing you could say. Well, I mean, Trump's not big on apologies, <laughs> and he said he had regrets. But but it's weird that he that he said he had regrets, but then didn't point out anything specific. It's also weird that Megyn Kelly didn't go after him and ask him what exactly are you talking about. He said so many things that have drawn pointed, brutal criticism. For him just to say, oh, every once in a while, maybe I said something unfortunate, and for there not to be follow up or more detail, I think a lot of folks are disappointed. Well, an interesting phrase that Megyn Kelly didn't go after him because she made clear that this was not a presidential debate. It was not an interview on the Kelly file about issues. It had been taped well in advance and that it was going to be somewhat of a softer personality profile, but obviously they talked about themselves. So what do you think is the impact of Trump saying, gee, maybe I shouldn't have retweeted Bimbo and that sort of thing? Any? Uh, no, I don't think it's got much, much impact. But look, I think um, the expectations for this thing were, were, were all off. I mean, Megyn Kelly's proven she can take uh, on Donald Trump and, and you know and really ask him the tough questions. That's how the whole thing started. Yeah. Uh, so I think you know again this was a different time, a different kind of interview, and uh, well, I don't think there was a lot of gotcha trying you know right. trying to like you know trip him up. Or well, Kelly, a lot of critics didn't like it, and that's fine. Everyone's entitled to their opinion, whether it was too soft or not. But uh, some of them, I felt, may have had an agenda. I'd like to get your thoughts. Slate's Isaac Chotner panned the interview. He has called Donald Trump a bigoted quasi-fascist. 
and fraud, a dangerously unstable demagogue. Washington Post Hank Stuver has called Trump hateful, nonsensical, vainglorious. Um, so they didn't like the interview. I mean, this is ironic, right? I mean, they all rallied toward Megyn Kelly's cause after the August debate, and they looked at her as some sort of champion. Uh, she's always been neutral. She says she doesn't love Donald Trump, she doesn't hate Donald Trump, and this was going to be uh, a fair interview, and that's what it was. And just because she didn't attack him, they are disappointed with it, and that's, that's just ridiculous. All right. said, it was it was, was pre-taped two weeks in advance, though, and so it's hard to do breaking news. At the Kel she she's looking at this to warm him up to get on the Kelly file, so that she can she can go after the hard-hitting stuff. This was more of a Barbara Walters type of Very interview. Good. She had the entire year, though, of his campaign statements to work with, and we didn't get any new information as far as how he saw the lead up. That's not but a breaking news. You should you should interview Megyn Kelly then. It shouldn't be an interview with Donald Trump, as right?